Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you all very much for coming. Uh, my name is James McDougall. I'm a fellow of Trinity, uh, which is the college that uh, hosts the Humanitas Visiting Professorship in Historiography. Uh, just a few words about the Humanitas program, uh, which I'm sure you're all by now familiar with, if, not, uh, if, if only through having uh, booked your place for tonight's event on its website. Um, the program is a series of visiting professorships in uh, humanities subjects run uh, in partnership between the Humanities Division in University and the Institute for Strategic Dialogue uh, in London. Uh, this chair is sponsored by the Blavatnik Family Foundation, and we're very grateful to Len Blavatnik uh, and his organisation for sponsoring uh, this series of events. The Humanitas programme in historiography is now in its uh, third year, and we're delighted to have with us uh, this year for this week uh, Professor Lynn Hunt, who is a distinguished research professor at the University of California, Los Angeles. Her lecture this evening uh, on human rights will be followed by a brief uh, response by Professor Sandra Fredman. Uh, thanks to Sandy for being here too. Uh, professor Fredman is a fellow of Pembroke. She is the Rhodes Professor of the Laws of the British Commonwealth and the USA. And in 2012, she founded the Oxford Human Rights Hub, which she's the director. She's an honorary QC and a fellow of the British Academy. Uh, when we started thinking about what uh, Lynn might talk about for this series of lectures, uh, she disarmingly said to me in an email that, as you know, my work tends to go off in many different directions, uh, a way of explaining uh, how difficult it was to, for her to decide what to talk about, but also a disarmingly understated way of uh, referring to her enormously wide historiographical range, a range uh, reflected also in her life. She was born in Panama, brought up in Minnesota, taught on the East Coast and the West Coast, uh, an undergraduate at Carleton College and PhD at Stanford. She taught at Berkeley and at Penn before moving to UCLA. And her range uh, historiographically uh, has, as you will know, been uh, rather extraordinary. She's one of the few historians, indeed I can't think of any other historians, uh, as comfortable as she is, both with literature, symbols, gesture and rhetoric on the one hand, and with statistical significance, discriminant analysis and correlation matrices on the other. I had a hard time even saying the last <laughs> three sets of words. <laughs> Among her major uh, works, uh, all of which stand as historiographical landmarks in their respective fields, are Politics, Culture and Class in the French Revolution, 1984, The New Cultural History of 1989, Telling the Truth About History, 1994, Beyond the Cultural Turn in 1999, and Inventing Human Rights, the subject of her lecture tonight in 2007. Amartya Sen has called her one of the leading historians of our time. We're very uh, happy to have her here to talk to us tonight. Uh, Please uh, join me in welcoming talks so of Professor Lynn Avery Hunter. Well, thank you so much for coming out on a somewhat blustery afternoon. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me to come here for this week, to which I am very much looking forward. Thank you to the donors and for the Institute and for Humanitas for organizing my visit. I am really thrilled to be here and very eager to get into discussion. But first, before we can have the discussion, you have to have the set lecture that sets things up. You may be puzzled by my title. Why should there even be a question about whether human rights need a history? I have written a history of human <laughs> rights myself, so am I really going to question the entire endeavor? There are two reasons why I pose the question in this way. First, human rights as a concept has a vexed relationship to history. And second, histories of human rights are surprisingly recent. I will try, try to drive home the second point first, because it is easier to make, and certainly easier to visualize, with the help of a diagram or two. As my slide shows, the number of English language books with human rights in the title shot up from 340 for the entire period, 1900 to 1945, to more than 50,000 
in the two decades between 1988 and 2008. Another way of visualizing this can be seen in my next slide, a Google engram of the phrase history of human rights from 1800 to 2000. Now, my WorldCat sample on the first slide simply gauges overall interest in human rights. The engram, this slide, gives perhaps a better sense of the interest in the history of human rights, as it is based on a text search of millions of books and is relative rather than absolute in its counting. That is, it takes into consideration the increasing number of books published over time. Despite the differences in measurement, it is clear that interest in the history of human rights is, cor is closely correlated to interest in human rights plain and simple, as the similarity to my next slide shows. This is an engram of human rights without history, and I apologize for the rights being taken off the side when I made a screenshot uh, for the purposes of my PowerPoint. I'm going to return to the question of whether human rights are really only a recent concern, datable to the 1980s or 1970s or post-World War II era, any of which arguments could be made from this slide. But for now, I just want to make the point that writing the history of human rights is relatively recent. A 2004 overview article on the history of human rights observed that most histories until then had been written by activists rather than historians, and that, to quote him, the field remains refreshingly inchoate. <laughs> Ten years later, I think there would actually be a much greater sense of definition of the field. My first point is closely related to the second. There were not many histories of human rights until recently because the existence of human rights did not depend on their development over time. Human rights are in that sense not historical. I will need to qualify that remark as I go along, which is why I say that their relationship to history is vexed. This vexatiousness became apparent when the United Nations decided to draw up a universal declaration of human rights. In 1947, at the behest of the Human Rights Commission of the new United Nations, UNESCO, the social and economic arm of the UN, sent a questionnaire to leading thinkers and writers around the world, asking them for their opinion on the basis of human rights. The decision to launch this inquiry revealed a worry about those footings. A book of a selection of those opinions was introduced by the French philosopher Jacques Maritain, one of the chief architects of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948 of the next year. In his remarks, he came to this conclusion, to which I will return. I quote him. The paradox is that such rational justifications are at once indispensable and yet powerless to bring about agreement between minds. They are indispensable because each one of us believes instinctively in the truth and will only assent to what he himself has recognized as true and based on reason." Unquote. Note that there is no mention of history here. Maritain then related the now famous anecdote about one of the preliminary UNESCO meetings. Someone in that meeting had expressed surprise that advocates of violently opposed ideologies had agreed on a list of rights. Yes, they said, we agree about the rights, but on condition that no one asks us why. The publication of a representative sample of differing opinions was intended to showcase these disagreements over philosophical doctrine. 
which nonetheless did not prevent agreement on a list of rights. Maritain attributed the victory of practical agreement over theoretical dissension to what he called currents of thought that were, in his words, in the course of taking root in the conscience of nations. Human rights have a vexed relationship to history because those rights are supposed to grow out of timeless truths that command, as Maritain put it, an instinctive belief. They may be based on reason, but they also depend on emotional adherence. We can see this by looking at the language of the Universal Declaration itself. The preamble begins with an assertion that is meant to be incontrovertible. I quote it, whereas recognition of the inherent dignity and of the equal and inalienable rights of all members of the human family is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. In legal language, whereas literally means taking into consideration the fact that. Thus, the opening of the preamble claims as a matter of fact that recognition of human rights is the foundation of freedom, justice, and peace in the world. It offers no argument and no evidence for this claim. Making an historical argument for this claim would be particularly difficult for which examples would one cite? In the English Bill of Rights of 1689, the members of Parliament asserted their ancient rights and liberties. But these were, for the most part, the rights of Parliament in relation to the monarchs, not the rights of all the subjects. The election of members of Parliament ought to be free, the Bill insisted. But Parliament set the bar for voting. Freedom of speech referred to debates in Parliament. As for freedom of religion, the bill was largely concerned with defending Protestants, which meant Anglicans, against the depredations of James II. Catholics got the right to sit as members of Parliament in 1829, as you surely know better than I. Finally, and perhaps most significantly, the rights cited were the rights of Englishmen, not universal human rights. So the 1689 Bill of Rights hardly constitutes an historical example of how human rights provide the foundation for freedom, peace, and justice in the world. The American Declaration of Independence and the French Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen both made claims about universal rights toward the end of the 18th century, but their histories pose problems too. For all its lofty rhetoric about self-evident truths un and unalienable rights, the American Declaration had no constitutional standing. The subsequent US Constitution, as you know, incorporated slavery into its very fiber, and a Bill of Rights was only granted rather grudgingly and under great popular pressure. It was ratified in 1791, three years after ratification of the Constitution. The US Constitution and its Bill of Rights, unlike the Declaration of Independence, refers only to the rights of US citizens, not universal rights. The French Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen of 1789 did serve as the preamble to the new French Constitution and did make universal claims for rights, to which I will return, not surprisingly, since I've spent my entire life working on the French Revolution. <laughs> but as an historical exemplar, it also had defects, if only because the Constitution to which it was attached was soon superseded and the Declaration with it. Moreover, the Declaration of Universal Human Rights did not serve as a bulwark against the terror in the French Revolution. Freedom of speech, the right to defense and trial, and freedom of religious expression were all circumscribed 
as they still are in many places in the name of national security. The sorry history of the French Declaration fits all too well with modern skepticism about human rights and the inability of the international community to uphold or defend them. So just what is the role of history in human rights? Many contributions might be cited. Activists quite legitimately long for a sense of their place in a longer history, a kind of historical GPS that reinforces their sense that they are following the right path. Any adult in the present who reads the newspapers or watches the news will wonder where the current rights talk came from and why it has the role it has today as a universal language of politics. One of the pressing issues of the present time is human rights. Do they warrant international intervention in the sovereign affairs of a nation, say, in Syria? What is the best forum for their discussion and defense? And should human rights even be the touchstone for international organizations? These are all worthy concerns. For me, however, history's most important role is in illuminating the paradoxes that still define rights today. Understanding those paradoxes is critical to answering the questions we pose in the present. I have preferred to dig into the history of one particular period, the 18th century, rather than try to write a long history of human rights. The long histories go back to the origins of Western civilization or various world cultures and trace the development of key ideas such as universal notions of the common good or the autonomous self. But it is in the Atlantic world at the end of the 18th century that human rights first gained expression as such and became politically operative. As the American Declaration of Independence put it, quote, to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just power from the consent of the governed. This is an incredibly radical statement, actually, uh, and we pass over it perhaps too easily. So what are the historical lessons that we can learn from the 18th century experience? The first of these has already come up in reference to the preamble of the Universal Declaration of 1948. Assertions of human rights depend on both rational and emotional claims. The appeal to reason appears to be timeless, but emotion is more clearly subject to historical development. This, in a nutshell, is what I call the self-evidence paradox. In the words of the American Declaration of 1776, quote, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, end quote. A self-evident truth requires no demonstration and therefore asserts its basis in timeless reason. But of course, not everyone in the 18th century and not everyone, certainly not everyone before then and probably not everyone now believes this contention to be true, especially when it comes to specifying just what those unalienable rights might be. The notion that rights are natural, based on human nature, universal, held by all people because they are human, and equal, not based on social standing, was a truth that only became self-evident, that is, emotionally convincing, to some people at a particular time and place. This is the paradox. It's supposed to be timeless and it turns out to be historical. Marie Tan's 1947 formulation of this paradox was not quite right in my view. He said, to remind you, 
The paradox is that such rational justifications are at once indispensable and yet powerless to bring about agreement between minds. They are indispensable because each one of us believes instinctively in the truth and will only assent to what he himself has recognized as true and based on reason." End quote. This was a profoundly ahistorical for formulation. The self-evidence claim, which is found in any declaration of rights, is not powerless to bring about agreement between minds. And it is not a matter of fact that each one of us will only assent to what he himself has recognized as true and based on reason. We can change our minds about what is true and based on reason. Mary Ten admitted as much himself when he attributed the successful formulation of a list of rights to currents of thought that were in the course of taking root in the conscience of the nations. It's that in the course of taking root that is crucial to me. The second lesson from the 18th century, then, is that for all their logical weaknesses, claims for human rights can change the course of history. Declaring rights can take on a life of its own, both in crystallizing belief in their self-evidence and in opening the door to further developments of rights. There is perhaps no better example of this rhetorical power than the case of gay marriage right now. But allow me instead to linger on the 18th century version, because I believe it makes the current situation easier to understand. The Declaration of the Rights of Man and Citizen of August 1789 provides a particularly potent example because it did have constitutional standing. The deputies had argued vociferously over several questions. Was a declaration necessary? Should it include a declaration of duties? Should it be affixed to the Constitution? And what should the list of rights include? Debates not unlike those in the 1940s. They only agreed upon a provisional document, but then they never revisited it. And its pronouncements remained so powerful that the preambles to the 1946 and 1958 French constitutions explicitly refer back to it. The 1946 preamble, for example, quote, solemnly reaffirms the rights and liberties of man and the citizen consecrated by the Declaration of Rights of 1789, end quote. The echoes in both the preamble and the articles of the United Nations Declaration are also striking but I have time to mention only one of them. Article 1 of the 1789 Declaration begins, men are born and remain free and equal in rights. Article 1 of the Universal Declaration of 1948 begins, all human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. The French Declaration of 1789 made no mention of the French king, the Catholic Church, or any other traditional French institution. It offered general principles based on reason that would apply to all men, meaning all people, and all political institutions, rather than referring to French history or Christian teachings. This universalism inevitably ran up against the limitations of practical implementation, as became apparent almost as soon as the Declaration was voted. Article 10 of the 1789 Declaration had guaranteed, to quote it, no one should be disturbed for his opinions, even in religion, provided that their manifestation does not trouble the public order as established by law, end quote. Conservatives agreed to this formulation because they hoped that this ambiguous wording, their manifestation does not trouble the public order, hardly a clarion call to religious freedom, would permit the continued exclusion of non-Catholics from political participation because it would trouble the public order, 
The practice of Calvinism had been illegal in France since 1685, and only in 1787 was a measure of religious toleration for Protestants restored. But it did not include political participation. When pressed by deputies explicitly citing the Declaration, however, the National Assembly granted equal rights to Protestants in December 1789. Jews then petitioned for their political rights, and after acrimonious debate, Jews gained equal political rights too in September 1791. The granting of equal political rights to Jews, almost unimaginable before 1789, shows the immense moral force of the act of declaring rights. As the noble deputy Stanislas Count of Clermont-Tonnerre argued in December 1789, and in fact they had this debate right around Christmas time in December of 1789, quote, there is no middle way possible. Either you admit a national religion or you permit everyone to have his own religious opinion and do not exclude from public office those who make use of this permission, end quote. When opponents succeeded nonetheless in tabling the question of Jewish political rights in December of 1789, various Jewish communities submitted petitions invoking the declaration in their favor. Rights were extended first to the Jews of southern France, after they petitioned claiming that they were actually already exercising them because no one had sort of realized that they should be prevented from doing it, and then to all Jews in France. In contrast, many states in the new United States restricted the right to hold office and sometimes even voting to Protestants. Jews gained the right to sit in the British Parliament in 1858. Austria-Hungary granted political rights to Jews in 1867, Portugal in 1911, Russia in 1917. The dynamic did not stop with the question of religious minorities. In late October 1789, the deputies decided to limit the right to vote to men who were at least 25 years old, were not servants or bankrupt, and who had paid taxes equal to three days of work. In this way, the deputies created a distinction between active and passive citizens. Only a few dissented, since the practice of limiting political participation to property owners was common everywhere in the 18th century. Yet some did protest, and after another upheaval in August 1792 toppled the monarchy, the new Republican government removed the property requirement, instituting universal manhood suffrage for the first time anywhere. Free blacks in the colonies demanded political rights, too, and so did advocates for women's rights. Free blacks eventually gained equal political rights, and slavery was officially abolished in 1794. But women did not obtain political rights in France until 1944. As these developments show, the contentious debates provo provoked by the tension between universal claims on the one hand and particular laws on the other could only be temporarily resolved by legislative decisions. The particular laws would invariably be compared to the universal principles, as the Declaration insisted they should be in its preamble. And since those particular laws reflected current customs and practices, they would often fall short of the universal principles and thus create demands for future changes in the laws. I need hardly remind you that the question of who could vote and hold office drove political conflicts throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, from Chartism in Great Britain in the 1840s to the civil rights movement in the United States in the 1960s. <coughs> While the steady drumbeat of demands for equal rights shows the power of universal claims, the inability of women to gain them demonstrates the tenacity of cultural habits and customs. The French deputies came to see the logic of recognizing the equal rights of religious minorities 
non-whites, and men without property. Already an incredible list. But this logic did not extend to women, despite the efforts of a hearty few to explain why it must. Women were citizens in that they lived in a nation governed by laws that pertained to them. But in the view of the vast majority of people in the 18th century, women could only be passive citizens. Women supposedly lacked the moral autonomy necessary to participate fully in political life. When newly elected deputies drafted a Republican constitution in spring 1793, a spokesman for the Constitutional Committee explained the common view. I quote him, it is true that the physique of women, their goal in life as wives and mothers, and their position as dependent on their fathers or husbands, distance them from the exercise of a great number of political rights and duties." End quote. But he also admitted the force of the arguments for women's rights that were now being made because of the Declaration. To quote him again, perhaps our current customs and the vices of our education make this distancing still necessary at least for a few years. The few years turned into 150 years in the French case, demonstrating the power of those current customs. The third historical lesson is already implicit in this brief history of rights in revolutionary France. Rights only become rights when they are claimed. And they are claimed when people feel that their rights have been violated. Now this is a crucial part of my argument that has everything to do with why rights have a peculiar relationship with history. Declarations of rights do not come out of a long historical tradition, even when a long historical tradition is subsequently posited, as in the English and American cases. Declarations of rights, and in many, if not most cases, the rights themselves, emerge, I argue, from a feeling of outrage. Reason, the search for rational justification, comes after the emotion. Arnold J. Lean, an American political scientist and one of the contributors to that UNESCO volume of 1947, astutely remarked in his contribution, and I quote him, bills of rights are always monumental indictments of regimes of the past, as well as promised safeguards against the same abuses by regimes of the future, end quote. They are, in that sense, fundamentally historical documents, even when they turn to universal principles for those promised safeguards. The English Bill of Rights of 1689 begins with a list of things James II did to, quote, subvert and extirpate the Protestant religion and the laws and liberties of this kingdom, end quote. Most of the American Declaration of Independence, which hardly anyone ever reads except for its famous one paragraph because it's kind of long and complicated, is taken up with an indictment of your George III. To quote it, the history of the present King of Great Britain is a history of repeated injuries and usurpations, all having in direct object the establishment of an absolute tyranny over these states. To prove this, let facts be submitted to a candid world." Unquote. Even the preamble of the Universal Declaration of 1948 refers, however briefly, to a history that must be overcome. Whereas, and I'm quoting it, whereas disregard and contempt for human rights have resulted in barbarous acts which have outraged the conscience of mankind." End quote. Now, the French Declaration of 1789 seems much less concerned with history. The preamble simply says, to quote it, considering that ignorance, neglect, 
or contempt of the rights of man are the sole causes of public misfortunes and governmental corruption, end quote, without referring to Louis XVI or his ministers. Yet this apparently simple assertion sums up a momentous development by which the rights of man came into public discourse, not just in France, but as a result of the French Revolution elsewhere as well. This slide shows that the rights of man, not human rights, was the dominant term for such rights until at least the 1840s. In English, I'm not talking about French here, I'm talking about in English. In other words, the English translation of les droits de l'homme, which is what the French call them. In French, droit de l'homme, uh, I, I apologize for the misspelling of droit de l'homme on the side, it's the way the Google came out for reasons that are too complicated to go into. Droit de l'homme far outpaces droit humain, you see it there in red, hardly above the surface on the bottom through the 19th century and indeed right up to the present. As far as I can determine from personal experience, only the Swiss, the French speaking Fr Swiss, talk about droit humain, not the French. Droit de l'homme, rights of man, had an episodic existed in existence in French in the 17th and early 18th century usually appearing in a religious context, the rights of man being contrasted to the rights of God. Only in the 1760s, as far as I can determine, did rights of man begin to take on its modern meaning of universal, natural, and equal rights. And only in the 1770s and 1780s did those rights come to be associated with the various campaigns for rights that had once been separate and now seemed connected. Religious toleration, the rejection of judicial torture and cruel punishment, freedom of the press, the abolition of slavery, and representative government. Whoops, I was wrong, what have I done here? Okay, okay, oh yes, I guess I just wanted, yes, okay, sorry. My slide based on Artful, which is just a database of French literature, going back quite far in the past and it is not complete. This is why I don't want to make too much of it, except for the fact that I had to do it by hand, in which case I want a lot of credit. My slide based on Artful, Google takes you know, 0.5 seconds, whereas Artful required actually some considerable investment of time. My slide based on Artful is imperfect because the database of French literature is selective. It does not include five million books. And I have generated the graph myself but it localizes the takeoff in French to the 1770s, which concords with the information glean, gleaned from Google as well. It actually also raises some very interesting questions about why the big jump towards the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, which we can talk about later if you like. By the end of the 1780s then, something entirely unexpected had occurred in France people had come to see these various campaigns as linked together under the rubric of rights. And when the revolution broke out in 1789, a declaration of such rights seemed virtually a foregone conclusion. People saw the connection between the rights campaigns because they felt the outrage provoked by violations of rights or of rights-bearing bodies though their outrage was not necessarily directed at the king himself or monarchy as an institution. Voltaire was only one of the many French philosophes who hoped that the king could become reformer in chief. The Protestant pastor Rabot Saint Etienne wrote to Louis XVI's government in 1787 to complain about limitations on Calvinists still present in the new Edict of Toleration. He wrote, the time has come when it is no longer acceptable for a law to overtly overrule the rights of humanity that are very well known all over the world." End quote. Rabot would not have written to the government if he had not expected to be heard. He would not have referred to them as essentially 
self-evident if a process had not occurred previously. There was no one treatise or pamphlet that provided the template for this development. It was instead the product of thousands or hundreds of thousands or perhaps even millions of individual epiphanies. Why did this coalescence take place in the 1760s and 1770s to make rights of man self-evident? There are no doubt many reasons. The influence of enlightenment thinking about the role of reason as a standard for judging social practices. The rise of a middle class public that demanded recognition. Even the spread of economic practices that demanded greater rationality of expectation. After all, what replaced cruel punishment, such as breaking on the wheel, transportation, the galleys, or branding? Rehabilitation in prison, so that the convict might re-enter society and repay his or her debts. An entirely different perspective on the meaning of punishment. Having found these explanations less than entirely convincing, I have tried to point toward new modes of personal autonomy and new expressions of empathy across class lines that appeared in the second half of the 18th century. These were enabled in part by the growing popularity of portrait painting and the rise of novel reading. I have shown, or think I have shown, that many leading figures of the Enlightenment failed to see the connection between the various reform campaigns. Even they had to come to feel the outrage. Voltaire, for example, famously defended the Protestant Jean Calas, who was tortured and broken on the wheel in 1762 for having supposedly killed his own son to prevent him from turning Catholic. But Voltaire found nothing wrong with the torture, the torture or breaking on the wheel until a, until a few years later when he read the French translation of Beccaria's little tract on crime and punishment. The French translator, unlike Beccaria himself, explicitly linked the arguments against torture and cruel punishment to the rights of man. Voltaire soon began referring to torture and cruel punishment as atrocious old customs, as if it were self-evident that they were unacceptable. While we might disagree as to the causes of this cultural and political transformation, and it pains me to summarize my argument in two sentences or two paragraphs, I would still uh, insist on the need for individual epiphanies, as I have called them. We know a right exists when we feel that something vital has been violated. Yes, of course, reason figures in this interaction because it helps us make sense of the feelings and fit them into an ongoing discussion or debate. But the emotional connection is crucial. If you would indulge me in one last slide, this one of human rights and rights of man in English from 1700 to 2000, I hope to conclude by arguing that the history of human rights, even in English, is not just one story of the vast increase of interest in human rights from 1948 forward. That is one tale to be told, and many are now engaged in working it out. There are other stories to be told, only one of which, the sudden upsurge of the rights of man because of the French Revolution, I have begun to suggest here. Others still remain to be told, even as that most ahistorical of notions, the rights of man, gets its history too. Thank you very much. Well, thank you um, for a really extraordinary um, account of the history of human rights. Um, and 
in particular from the perspective of a human, of a human rights lawyer, this history um, raises some quite important questions which, as human rights lawyers, we perhaps don't think about enough. Um, and in particular, there, th there, there are three things which come out of Professor Hunt's most interesting and, and fascinating account. Um, she counterposes human rights with, um, on the one hand, the claim of being self-evident, and on the other hand, the historical evolution, and posits what she calls the self-evidence paradox, uh, leading into the second point, which is that, in the end, the self-evidence paradox has itself got the power to convince. So that, on the one hand, which is her second point, there's a link between rational justification and um, emotional buy-in or the need for a sense of outrage. And yet, and of course we're all familiar with the, with the sense that, that she described that um, human rights may, uh, there may be agreement as to the conclusions, but no agreement as to the reasons for the conclusions. And as Sunstein talks about partially theorized agreement, uh, Dworkin talks about overlapping consensus. Um, so there is a sense that we need to buy into the conclusions, each of us for our own reasons. And some of these reasons may well be emotional as, mu as much as rational reasons. But Professor Hunt's account is, is so interesting in that she takes it a step further and says, once we have those human rights, they themselves have a power to convince just by being declared as human rights. Um, and so this, uh, and in particular, she talks about how having declared rights in, in the 18th century, they were then used to convince, um, to, to as a reason for extending them to other groups such as slaves, Jews and others, but only very much later to women. So what is the difference? What is it that gives the rights the power to convince in some situations and not in others? And that seems to point towards um, activism and what, are the, what has been the role of those on the ground. Um, what I think I, I would like to talk about um, is how this sense of, on the one hand, um, emotional outrage as giving rise to human rights, and on the other hand, rights gathering their own momentum through their power to convince. Um, what that means about not just the history of human rights, but the future of human rights. And those of us who are, w those of us who are working in human rights, who are working on the evolution of human rights, um, and a lot of my work has been on the development from civil and political rights to socioeconomic rights, obviously the development of women's rights, and particularly what role human rights has to, pay, has to play in addressing poverty. Now that's, um, at the moment, um, looking, looking at the current and the future um, evolution, we see some philosophers being very concerned about what they regard as human rights inflation. And so a pushback by philosophers such as Griffiths, who talks about the idea of normative agency. Um, and so much so that some philosophers, some current philosophers, more than one, don't even see the rights in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights or as all being human rights. And the example they all use is the right to holidays with pay, which in more than one modern philosophical tract is referred to as being outrageous and that we would all agree could not possibly be a human right. And yet the Universal Declaration regards it as a human right. It's there and it was declared in, as part of the consensus that Professor Hunt has referred to. So that, so that makes us ask, well, what makes it a human right? And also whose sense of, of outrage counts? And it may be that for philosophers, being deprived of a paid holiday might not mean a huge amount. <laughs> but for those subject to grinding labor, 
There may be very little between forced labour, um, uh, well, it may be very close to forced labour if they don't have a right to holidays with pay. So we ask whose outrage counts, and also we then say, and I'm sure this is what Professor Hunt is saying, is that a sense of individual outrage isn't enough. It has to be combined with the ongoing consensus and our ability to say, well, if it's there in the Universal Declaration, that in itself should be a reason for, a, for believing that it is a right, and that should give a, a itself count as a reason for convincing. Um, and of course, that's part of what we would call the expressive or communicative function of, a, of, of human rights. Um, that human rights law expresses a certain commitment to certain aspirations. Um, so then, coming back to the question of how, how do we see these insights as telling us about the future evolution, um, and how do we decide what rights count as fundamental human rights, given the history which shows that it's contentious, um, took a long time for women's rights to be counted, and women's rights are still quite fragile in many parts of the world. Um, so, um, in that sense, we see, we ask, what does it mean for a right to, what, what does it mean once we give it a status as a human right? And that, the status of a fundamental human right is um, in terms of certain obligations that states have towards their citizens. They're not just policy aspirations, they're not just wish lists. Um, as in the Millennium Development Goals, but there are um, requirements that states need to aspire, need to take reasonable steps towards. Um, and in that sense, um, we are possibly heartened by the idea that. Um, Declaring a human right can itself give them a life of their own, particularly in the current climate in the UK, which, as we know, there's been a very strong pushback against human rights. And interestingly, the pushback has been against the European Convention of Human Rights, which some might regard as the most, as the core of human rights coming out of the, the, the Second World War, largely civil and political rights, not contentious socioeconomic rights, um, and yet, um, and not co co contentious socioeconomic rights such as in the South African Constitution, which now has rights of access to health care, rights to housing, and rights to social welfare. Um, and yet in the UK, the main gripe against the European Convention is against what we might consider to be one of the most fundamental de democratic rights, which is the right to vote, and in this case, the right of prisoners to vote. Um, so whose outrage counts in this context becomes a crucial question. Um, certainly when we look at the debates around prisoners' right to vote, there are many in the ruling classes who say, prisoners don't really want to vote, but yet we do see uh, significant numbers of cases brought by prisoners um, claiming a right to vote. And so, in, in a sense, um, there is a need to think about whose voice counts in this outrage, and in a way, human rights themselves give people a voice. So it's in the end, a virtuous circle that having a human right of freedom of speech gives you the right to speak, having the right to vote gives you other consequent rights. Um, and therefore, coming out of, of, of what has been said, we, we, we can see this more as, as about an ongoing cost contestation, that human rights are not settled, but are all about this combination between um, the power to convince, the power to declare, the sense of outrage, the need for human rights to give a voice, but at the same time, the need to have a voice in order to uh, have your rights uh, acknowledged. Um, and 
I was particularly taken by prof um, Professor Hunt's exegesis of women's rights, on which I've also been working, um, where much has been achieved, but as I said, in many countries, particularly in parts of, of, of Africa and elsewhere, um, women are still secondary citizens. They still do not have the same rights in customary law, inheritance. They are stu still subject to um, high degrees of violence and um, remain amongst the poorest in the world. And in this sense, we worry about claims of cultural relativity where it's argued that Fem that women's rights are a Western imposition. And so I end this very scattered and fragmented discussion of, of the interesting points that have, raised, that have been raised by um, what Professor Hunt concluded on, which is we know a right exists when we feel that something vital has been violated. Reason figures in this interaction because it makes us, it helps us make sense of the feelings, but the emotional connection is crucial. And so where I leave us with is that we still need to be sure in this debate that when we talk about we, as we know a right exists and we feel a sense, we are um, clearer, we are clear, or at least we are open to the question of who, whose voice is included in the outrage and um, whether lack of rights has deprived those very people whose voice we should be hearing of the ability to express that outrage. So thank you.